his uh, talk. Okay. All right. Thanks. So I'm going to uh, start sharing again. See how it works. All right. Does that look okay? That's, that looks fine. Yeah, we can awesome. see it. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. So, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you again for for the kind introduction and the and the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be able to give this talk and to visit uh, virtually. Um, so, I'm Paulo Poschi. I'm, I work at the Center for Quantum Information and Control at University of New Mexico in the United States. And um, <clears throat> I, today I'm going to present a talk that it's basically about control of open quantum systems, um, which is a very broad topic. And I'm going to be focusing on, on this uh, concept of information backflow and what I like to call using the coherence to our advantage. Um, but I'd like to uh, start by kind of motivating, you know, why these things might be important from a uh, kind of a broader context and try to relate a bit to this kind of emerging, well, maybe not so emerging anymore, a uh, field of quantum technologies. So <clears throat> um, here, you know, we talk about control, we talk in general in science, we talk about manipulating the evolution of a system for a specific purpose, right? I, I, I like this quote, even though I, I'm a theoretical physicist we, who studied uh, fundamentals about things, that control turns science into technology, right? And that, in some sense, gives us uh, an idea of how important that is. Now, in terms of uh, technologies, right now we are there's a lot of talk and a lot of development on quantum technologies, right? And we know about, we've learned about all these uh, potential applications of, of quantum systems, including quantum computing, quantum simulation, quantum sensing, and quantum communication. And we know that um, you know, perfectly coherent quantum devices, if they exist, um, if they are properly operated or, or controlled, can outperform classical devices or the classical counterparts in many of these tasks, which is very encouraging. But at the same time, uh, we know that quantum devices kind of intrinsically face one big uh, problem, which is that of uh, decoherence. So here I'm talking about decoherence as a uh, as a, a general uh, concept or a general effect that refers to washing out of quantum properties. Um, so I'm, I'm being kind of loose in the definition of decoherence, but typically we think about decoherence as uh, washing out uh, coherence, entanglement, and it could be other quantum properties that in the end makes sense, makes in the context of quantum devices, makes them lose their quantum advantage, right? So in some sense, quantum properties become more classical. Now, physically, the coherence arises due to many different things. They have kind of uh, slightly different origins. You could have a technical um, origin, for example, noise in the system, inhomogeneity in your ensemble, or in shot-to-shot -shot, uh, variations. And uh, it could also happen, and it's particularly important for microscopical system because there is an unwanted coupling to other degrees of freedom, right? Which we typically call the environment. And um, this unwanted, I think this is particularly interesting in the context of, of quantum devices and the context of control because it, it sounds like ev every time the system is not perfectly isolated, there's going to be the coherence, and that's actually true. And that's important for devices because our systems cannot be perfectly isolated. They, we, we need to be able to access them at some level to be able to manipulate them. And so there's kind of this tension between, you know, how much we try to access them and control them and how isolated they are. And um, one might think that, you know, th this is kind of a, a game stopper, but actually, we know that these devices don't have to be perfect, right? Uh, a little noise is still manageable for for quantum applications, and <clears throat> in the context of quantum computing and in other contexts as well, uh, this is due to the theory of quantum error correction, right? That 
uh, it says that a little the devices can have a little noise, and if that noise is below some threshold, then errors can be correct. But <clears throat> kind of in, in the meantime, uh, we need to, it's very important to understand how to control systems, quantum systems in the presence of decoherence, which are these uh, open quantum systems, so say in contact with their environment. And um, fundamentally also, this is very interesting because the most general kind of quantum evolution is this open quantum evolution. So understanding how to control that, uh, it's interesting in itself. Um, it will also gives us tools to fight decoherence, and so makes make try to make our device more you know more uh, perfect, let's say, or uh, near nearer that uh, threshold that we need for uh, errors to be corrected. And uh, maybe my focus here is that understanding these things more profoundly might reveal scenarios where <clears throat> we can leverage quantum environments to our advantage. So maybe scenarios in which the coherence is actually not that bad and uh, we can take advantage of it to, to make a, to perform a particular task. And that's really going to be the, the focus today. So um, the, the outline of the talk is basically, I want to start, spend some time at the beginning giving an overview of what is known of um, the control of open quantum systems. Um, without getting into much detail, but you know, maybe given some references which might be important. And I'm going to be focusing on the usual case, which is the case of Markovian evolution. I'm going to explain in a bit what that is. And in the second part, I'm going to be talking about um, a more general kind of quantum evolution of in quantum open quantum systems, which is this non-Markovian maps. Introduce this concept of information backflow and tell you a bit about our work on how this might be useful for controlling quantum systems, and that, that this has been work uh, with my previous advisor, Leo Wisniaki, and uh, this work has really been led by uh, Nicolas, who was introduced before, and he is in the audience. And um, and so, you know, if there are discussions and questions afterwards, uh, Nicolas can jump in and 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 um, join the discussion as well. All right, so <clears throat> let's start then with the this overview of control in, in open quantum systems. So here, open quantum systems, an open quantum system is, is regarded as a, a uh, let's do the pointer thing, which I haven't done, sorry. So it's regarded as a system, um, the central system, which is coupled to an environment, okay? And the idea is that we, take this composite system and we uh, assume it evolves unitarily, which is the, the most general thing it, it can do. Uh, if this is now my, my this, this system does not interact with anything else, right? But the, I'm going to be assuming that uh, I only have access to the states of the system, right? I only have access to measurements in this system S and everything else, every other degree of freedom is uh, part of the environment and I don't have access to that. To measurements on that directly. And so uh, mathematically that means that the state of the system that I have access to is described by the partial trace of the total uh, density matrix, right? So I'm going to, I need to be uh, tracing the environmental degrees of freedom for the total density matrix and that gives me a reduced uh, state. If uh, the system and the environment does, didn't have any um, correlations originally, then one can show that uh, this evolution, the evolution of rho of zero, the, the, the state of the system at time equal zero, to the state of the system at time equal t, is given by a map, a linear map, uh, which is typically called CPTP in short, for, for a completely positive trace preserving map, right? And that basically means that it's a map that is going to take states to other states. So this is the most general kind of quantum evolution possible, right? And please, if there are any you know, questions, just uh, you can unmute yourselves and, and just stop me. And, and you know, I'll be happy to answer any questions that might arise uh, along the way. So 
in this, this is a most general kind of quantum evolution. In the first part, I'm going to be focusing on a particular subset of this evolution, um, which is basically the one that complies with this very important property, which is the semigroup property, right? So from mathematics, we know that a semigroup is basically a set of elements with some operation, which in this, in this case is kind of a multiplication or concatenation. And such that if I multiply two maps, I get a new map, right? So here the idea is that if I were uh, the semi-group properties, that if I evolve from zero to T, or if I evolve from, and I multiply uh, by the evolution of going from zero to S, then I'm going to go to the evolution from zero to T plus S. This property implies a very uh, related property, which is the one that we uh, care about, which is that of divisibility, which is that it's kind of similar, but here you can see that suppose I have two times T1 and T2, where T1 is smaller than T2. So this property means that the evolution from zero to T1, it's connected to the evolution from zero to T2 by another map, which bridges that gap from T1 to T2, which is also CPTP, which is the non-trivial thing. This thing could be a map that's not completely positive and trace preserved. If it is, then the map is divisible. And it turns out that it's, it's easy to show that if that happens, then the evolution at T2, the state at T2, is connected to the state at T1 by a CPTP map. And so that means that the evolution is memoryless, right? Because the state at T2 can be written as some map times the state at T1, but nothing before that. And so uh, this name Markovian, of that we give to the maps come from the fact that uh, or, or are associated with this divisible um, CPTP maps. All right. So there's a question. There's a question from Apurva. Yes. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Please. Yeah. This decomposition is uh, not the most general one because. The CPTP map arises only when the initial state is factorized. Absolutely. If the initial state is not factorized, then the most general evolution is not CPTP. So here, this situation will arise uh, only if there is some condition on the state at time T1. But after T1, it may not be factorizable state, and then the next uh, statement of how it evolves will uh, not always be CPTP. So you are making some additional uh, assumption. I mean, so the assumption is always this one, right? I, I, this one, which is about the initial state. The initial state has to be uncorrelated. And that's absolutely true. Uh, so every time I say this is emotional quantum evolution, that's not true. I mean, it's uh, given this. Once you assume this, this is what you have assigned from the initial state, and then if you assume the dynamical set, the, yeah, the semi-group property holds, then is when this holds, when this is a, this is CPTP. Okay, is does that make sense? Yeah, but what if uh, phi of T10 is not factorizable? Phi of T10 does not, uh, what, what do you mean factorizable? Like uh, mapping uncorrelated states to uncorrelated states? No, then the map of phi of T2 to T1 doesn't have to be CPTP. Uh, no, no, it doesn't have. That's why I'm saying that I'm saying that if if this happens, then that implies divisibility. And in that case, yeah. this map, that's the case in which this map is CPTP. And that's the ones that we call Markovian. Okay, so, so it's, I'm just it's pointing out that you are making an additional assumption of this uh, dynamical semigroup. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's a subset of all the CPT maps. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's very important. So a subset of the CPTP maps are the ones that we associate with the semi-group, which have which are the ones that at the end we call Markovian. So these uh, maps uh, might be more familiar if we look at um, the generator of the master equation. So the semi-group property um, is going to be related to the fact that these maps, the ones that comply with this, 
um, have, a, have an exponential representation and that exponential has a generator or is um, say described by a generator which allows us to write a time local master equation in this way. This generator is, you might, this is maybe the, the most familiar aspect of this, is uh, what's typically called the Lindblad form or uh, that generates the Lindblad equation. So this is a theorem from, you know, uh, some time ago, a very uh, famous result that basically says that uh, if L is the generator of a divisible map, if and only if it has this form, um, and this is typically referred to as Lindblad equation, where we have, you know, we are going to have one part of the evolution given by some Hermitian part, er, Hermitian operator, which we associate with the Hamiltonian, and then, then this other part, which is going to encompass decoherence and dissipation, all non-unitary effects. Okay, and so um, again, I'm not going to be focusing on this case, but uh, this is really important because. It means that for these type of maps, the Markovian maps, we have a general mathematical framework to study Markovian evolution, right? So that means that um, if one wants to study, say, a control problem on this kind, particular kind of, of maps, one can take a, a phenomenological approach and say, well, my most general evolution is given by Lindblad equation. I can choose and play around with the set of uh, Lindblad operators, and I have a perfectly good quantum evolution. As I'm going to describe afterwards, that's not obvious. Of course, from a more physical point of view, one can say, well, um, this phenomenological, if I want to take a microscopical approach, let's say, then what one should do is one has a physical system and then one has a physical environment. And what happens is that one tr models the environment in some way, for example, an environment of harmonic oscillators, um, and tries to obtain the evolution of the system, or at least an equation of motion. And what happens typically this is kind of very broadly speaking, if I have a large unstructured environment with weak coupling to a system, and then there are a few approximations that can be done, such that the microscopic model, which is very complex, it has a lot of degrees of freedom, um, can be at the end casted as a master equation that has lean platform. OK, so what I'm trying to say here is that even though this is a kind of mathematical result, it's of course well known that, you know, many important uh, physical models for, for environments at the end lead to a master equation in lead lab form. Um, and so <clears throat> in this in this context of Markovian evolution, one could ask, well, what happens then if one wants to control the system uh, in this in this scenario. So let me tell you a bit about, about the the idea of, of what I mean by control. So here is our system um, and we say we prepare in some initial state rho sub zero and we have some target state right here which we want to drive the system to. So suppose first that there is no environment and that also there is no control on the system. So then the, the system is going to evolve by this equation where H0 describes some uh, drift Hamiltonian, right? It's kind of its own Hamiltonian without any driving or control. And so what typically happens is that by its own evolution, the system evolves somewhere to some state that is not the target in general. I add my fields, then what happens is that uh, now the evolution is dictated by a modified Hamiltonian. It's still unitary. That Hamiltonian might be, or typically we think about as decomposed in, you know, a sum of, of control terms that are driven by some time dependent field. And uh, what's very important about this is that if this is the scenario, then due to the fact that unitary operators form um, a Lie group, there is a, a theorem uh, and a way of assessing whether a target is reachable or not. And um, here basically what it says is that if I take my drift Hamiltonian, if I take all the, the terms in the Hamiltonian and I analyze what's the Lie algebra associated with it, which is basically saying, you know, I take all the elements in the Hamiltonian and I 
calculate their commutators and I analyze how many other Hamiltonians I can create by commutating these terms. If I do that, and it turns out that by doing that, I can generate the whole uh, space, uh, then the system is called completely controllable. And that basically means that any state can be reached from row zero, uh, provided that they are in the same orbit, right? But um, for pure states, let's say, a completely controllable system basically means that I can start in any initial state and by properly choosing the driving fields, I would be able to uh, reach any other pure state. OK, and this, is, this is a very important result, even though it doesn't give us the recipe to how to do it, which is typically a problem that is solved numerically. It's a theorem that allows us to assess when this is possible in principle. But as I was saying before, in any scenario here, we are interested about having the environment, right? And when we have the environment, the evolution is not unitary anymore. And um, particularly here, we are thinking about these uh, divisible maps or Markovian evolutions in this first part. And so now the equation is different, right? We have this new part which uh, encompasses dissipation, the coherence and all, all of that. And so typically what happens is that if, you know, if one has designed the controls thinking that the evolution was unitary, then this guy was going to go to row target, but because of the presence of the environment, it actually, the evolution deviates. And here, you know, situation becomes more complicated, uh, say mathematically, because um, one cannot, at least in general, prove a similar result, or at least it hasn't been done, um, for controllability, right? And this can be traced back to the fact that, as I was saying before, in this Markovian evolution, form a semigroup instead of a group, and the semigroup implies the lack of an inverse, which in some sense uh, implies the lack of a recurrence, which is modeling the, uh, say, irreversibility that's present in the, in the system. And so controllability is hard to assess in general for, for open quantum systems. And, um, you know, in, in the, you, this is a, a very nice reference where the, the, the case of a one qubit is assessed. Even in those cases, there is this notion that, um, you know, if, if, of course, if I wanted to drive my system from initial pure state to a fixed target pure state, then this kind of noise is going to be very detrimental um, to that, uh, right? And so, um, in this type of maps, then, you know, Markovian uh, noise, uh, as we are calling it, is constraining us in some way to what we can do with control. And so before I uh, start talking about these other types of map, I, I want to say a few words about what we can uh, regard to see the scenario when, when we have this uh, type of environment. So I was saying before that in control, we want to drive the system to a target state, right? And uh, when we have the environment, you know, we have this notion of dissipation or decoherence, which drives uh, the system uh, irreversibly, uh, at least in part irreversibly. Now, it could happen, uh, and I, I should mention this for completeness, that my target state is actually a steady state of the, of the system plus environment, right? So it could happen that I'm lucky enough that my environment is making my system relax to a state that's the one that I want, which is fantastic, right? And that's uh, the basis of lots of uh, applications of how to use Markovian dynamics to control. And the way that works is that um, if one wants to, if one has the ability to engineer the environment, right? So to change the degrees of freedom of the environment or the interactions of the environment with the system. Uh, if one has access to that, then it, that's a very important toolbox because it might allow us to uh, design an evolution that uh, basically evolves to a state state that's the state that I want. So, you know, depending on the physical uh, implementation that might be 
reasonable to think about or not, but that has definitely been uh, an approach um, for this. And it's know that if that is possible in principle, that's very, very powerful. Actually universal for quantum computing, for example. But, you know, it requires the resource of being able to couple your system to different finely tuned environments. But I would say more generally, if if your target state is not the state state, um, then typically what you want to do is you want to fight the, the coherence, right? Um, and so here there are a few scenarios. One of them, the, or a few things that you can do. Uh, one of them is basically saying, well, my environment is going to make my system relax or evolve in certain time scale. And so I should try to control my system as fast as possible such that the environment can induce that relaxation too much. And so this, this is related to studying what are the fundamental limits to controlling a system or the, to the speed of evolution of a system, which is called a quantum speed limit. Um, another approach is combining systems uh, such that uh, you get these decoherence-free subspaces, which is in some sense related to quantum error correction, which is basically saying, well, suppose I have two systems that are coupled to the same environment. Um, so depending on how they are coupled to the environment, I could maybe um, choose a subspace of the composite system that is unaffected by the coherence, which again depends on the kind of coupling that you have, but uh, that uh, is also possible. And this, then there is this part of dynamical decoupling and reverse control, which is uh, this is very related to the field of, of quantum control, which basically what you want to, what you're going to try to do is to use these fields, uh, not only to control the system, but also to try to decouple your system from the environment. And this is, you know, uh, that this last field has a long history, uh, including NMR and uh, SpinEco and HanEco experiments. And uh, right now it has kind of grown into a field of its own. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a very powerful technology for trying to um, decouple. So what you do is you drive the system typically very fast with pulses to uh, reverse the sign of the interaction between the environment and the system. So that, oh, again, can only be used done in certain cases. But if you can do that, then effectively you um, say eliminate the that coupling to first order, so you make the coherence a bit weaker. Um, okay, so this is basically a scenario for the, the Markovian case. Uh, I, I would say this is a very kind of broad overview. This is a paper right here. It's a very nice review from a few years ago uh, about controlling open quantum systems. All right, so what, what I meant to convey was that uh, the Markovian case is very well understood. It's very robust to say mathematically, right? We have this Wimbler equation. We can do lots of things with it, but it constrains us a bit in terms of control. And so uh, the question in the second part is what happens if we consider more general kind of evolution? Uh, is there something there that you know, by relieving these constraints, there's something there that we could use for a specific purpose. And our goal here, and I'm going to tell you about this, is to use it for uh, uh, control. All right. And so for this, I need to tell you a bit about these non-Markovian maps, right? So everything I said up to now, uh, it was for Markovian maps and this divisible property that led to uh, what we call Markovian. So what's a non-Markovian map? Well, a non-Markovian map is um, one of these CPTP maps that it's not Markovian, which is, a, a, of course, it's a not very meaningful characterization, right? Um, we expect this, you know, this situation to arise when these approximations, like the von Markov approximations are not possible, and it happens when we have a small environment, maybe at, at low temperatures, we have strong couplings or very structured um, um, spectral densities or stuff like that. I'm going to be showing you examples of, of this in a bit. Um, and, 
you know, the challenge, of course, uh, in, in, when I compare it to what I was saying before, is that here we don't have a limbled equation. So we don't have a unified mathematical framework to tackle these non markovian maps. Uh, and I, here I'm just mentioning a few of the approaches that are there in the literature. Then, you know, this is a very vast field. There are a few reviews here um, from 2016 to 2017 um, about non Markovian dynamics in open quantum systems, which are extremely good. Um, there are you know, many approaches to solving non Markovian master equations, including these stochastic master equations uh, proposed or developed uh, in, by Sora and Gardiner um, and others. We have tricks like these hierarchy equations of motion where we define auxiliary systems that uh, are virtual and that couple to uh, our system of interest. Um, there, you know, the, the full system plus environment um, problem is a many body system or many degrees of freedom is very hard to solve, but there there are techniques from to do that, to solve that from condensed matter, which uh, has have been used to solving these open quantum systems. Anyway, there are many of them. There are also uh, many attempts to put a Limblad equation to kind of uh, take the Limblad equation, make the coefficients time dependent, and see when the dynamics is non Markovian. So there are many approaches to try to tackle this problem. And uh, in parallel to this, there has been many proposals to characterize non Markovianity and to witness and quantify it. Right. And uh, again, there has been a lot of interest in this in the last you know, 10 plus years. Um, and so it's, it's important that I say which I'm going to be focusing on one aspect of non Markovianity, which is one of the most uh, you know, well accepted ones, but it's still just one. And uh, it's worth saying that there has been many proposals to witness non Markovianity, and none of them are necessarily equivalent, which it's fine because I've, you know, this is a very general kind of evolution, and these uh, things are measuring um, different aspects of the non Markovianity. So I'm just going to mention two of them. The first one was proposed by Rivas, Welg, and Plenio in this paper right here, and here they propose to assess or measure how non Markovian the map is by measuring the distance between the my map, right, the map that one is interested in, to a set of divisible maps, right, or Markovian maps. So by defining some distance between uh, or in the space of, of linear maps, uh, one could assess how non-Markovian the evolution is in this way, which is, you know, sounds very reasonable, uh, but it's perhaps a bit hard to connect to, you know, physical properties. And this other, this other uh, proposal, which is the one that I'm going to be focusing on, was proposed by Breuer, Lane, and Pirio in this other paper. And this is related to a very interesting concept, which is that of the existence or not of an information backflow from the environment to a system. Okay. All right. So let me tell you in detail what this information backflow is. So suppose you have two states, row one and row two and we can define the trace distance between them. So this is just a measure of distance between states. It has, say, two important properties. One is invariant under the unitaries, and the other, the most important one, is contractive under general CPTP maps, Markovian and non-Markovian, all of them. So that means that if, if I take that my two states and apply the same map to both of them, then the distance between those new states are is less than the original one. And so <clears throat> suppose I, I have some evolution and I, I take two initial states and I look at the distance between the evolved states as a function of time, I will call that the distinguished unit. Okay. Um, so the property here means that uh, for a general map, this function of time can never exceed its initial value. Okay, that's really uh, the most the, the constraint that this function that I'm going to be plotting here has to comply. With. That comes from this one right here. And so 
<clears throat> what the you know the the authors that proposes uh, realize is that basically you have two scenarios in which you can comply with this. Th this is one of them, right? Where the distinguishability is going to start here and it's going to uh, monotonically decay in time. And so if you have <clears throat> this scenario, then what you can think of is that the information about what the states were, right, which is or how distinguishable they were, it's continuously lost, right? So at the end, if this reaches zero, then I have the two states that I had prepared, which were different before they were distinguishable before now that information is gone. And so that is associated with a loss of information, continuous loss of information from the system to the environment. And it turns out that if the map uh, that I'm uh, talking about is divisible, right, is Markovian, then we know that this is the case. So then we know that this function um, is going to uh, be monotonically decreasing. And so we associate this with a Markovian case. But there is another possibility, right? You could have, um, as long as this function doesn't uh, exceed the initial value, you can still have this kind of evolution. So in this evolution, what happens is that distinguishability drops, but then it revives, right? And then it drops again, and then it revives, and you can have this maybe uh, periodic, not necessarily periodic, but you have these revivals, right? So what happens in these revivals is that the states were becoming more, you know, less distinguishable, and then suddenly that information kind of came back, right? They kind of remember who they were, and so uh, that's a revival in the distinguishability, and that is associated with the fact that there is information that had gone into environment which is now coming back. And this this is what we call information backflow, right? The information flows back from the environment to the system. And this is what we associate with non Markovianity. <clears throat> so this uh, proposal allows us to define a, a way of measuring non Markovianity, which is basically we, in some sense, we count the number of revivals that we have, right? We do it in a, in a you know, bit nicer way, right? We maximize overall states and we say, well, uh, I'm going to integrate all the parts of these curve where uh, the derivative is positive, right? In that, in some sense, the more revivals that I have, the more non-Markovian my evolution is, okay? Okay, so this is uh, what we are interested in. This is the property that we think is interesting, or one of one particular property that we think is interesting in non-Markovian evolution. And I think, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of reasonable to think that this might allow for something better than Markovianity, right? Because in Markovianity, we have this kind of decay of, of coherence or this continuous decay of coherence, and this information backflow allows something to go to come back to the environment. So the question is, can we harness this for something useful, right? And in our context, what we are asking is, can we find a control task that uh, cannot be achieved if the environment is Markovian or if the map is Markovian, but we can achieve if the if the environment is not Markovian. And this is something that was, um, you know, interests us very much because we wanted to isolate what aspect of uh, the coupling to the environment could we use to control. And so <clears throat> this is the setup that that we came up with. So suppose you have a bipartite system, right? So you have two parts in your system that uh, couple to the environment, and the control is the task that you want to do. You want to start from a separable state, uncorrelated state, to an entangled state, right? And so you have two systems, S1 and S2. You want to generate entanglement between them. But at the same time, these two systems are both coupled to, the, to a common environment. OK, and so we know that entanglement can be generated by just the fact that these two guys are coupled to the same uh, environment. But here, what we what we want to do is we want to um, optimize that entanglement, right? So we are going to introduce a time dependent field. Here, right, but we are going only to couple it to S1. 
right? And so what we argue here is that uh, this field is going to be able to control the, the state of S1. And if the dynamics is non Markovian, because of the existence of an information backflow, we argue that the information can travel from the field to S1 to environment and then back to S2. And thus, this field can, in some sense, control both systems through the environment. But we argue that can only happen if the dynamics is non Markovian. And so, if that is true, then the degree of control that one achieves should increase as the degree of non Markovianity increases. Okay, because we are in non Markovianity is allowing for an additional channel of information uh, to travel through the environment back to S2. If the dynamics is Markovian, then information travels from here to here to here, but it cannot go back anywhere. And so to compare, this is what we call the single addressing protocol. And so to compare, we can say, well, then if the field, if I take a field and I apply it to both guys, right, to both systems, then here information backflow cannot, will not play any role, right? Because it's not really allowing for any new kind of information to travel in the system because the, the field is already coupled directly to both systems. So what we expect in this other uh, regime is that normal grain should not play a role in the area of control. OK. All right. So we want to test this kind of conjecture about whether information backflow can help us control. And again, here we are, um, you know, faced with the fact that, that we have no kind of general equation of motion for a non Markovian system, right? So we need to resort to particular models. Of course, there are many models of non Markovian dynamics. That's not a problem. Um, you know, what, what one wants is to have a, a system that you can solve, that you can get the equations of motion without making any assumption of Markovianity, which is complicated, but, you know, can be done. The main problem is that since we are adding uh, a time dependent field that we want to optimize over, that model, that equation of motion needs to be valid for a, an arbitrary time dependent field. And uh, this is that can be really challenging because, you know, when you, one um, makes approximations to the other equations of motion, uh, you know, it's not very often that one assumes the existence of an arbitrary time dependent field. And this paper, I just put it here because it, it illustrates the fact that you cannot just take a model for a non Markovian system, add control and expect everything to work, right? It could very well happen that once you add the control, um, the equations of motion are not valid anymore. So you need to solve them from first principles. Um, well, I don't know if you need to do that, that but at least for um, the cases that I'm going to be talking about, we need to uh, assume that the existence of the control from the beginning. All right, so <clears throat> this can be done in a, in a well, sorry in a number of ways. Um, so one way that I'm not going to be describing is that uh, you can take a small system, right? So suppose you take two qubits to spin one halves, and you couple these two to a small environment, say I don't know six, eight, ten other qubits, such that you can solve numerically the dynamics of the whole system. So that's an approach, and that is going to typically lead you to non Markovianity once you trace out the, you know, what you define as the environment. And uh, and that's the, that model is developed in this paper. And then there is this other model that we developed with Nicolas, where um, it turns out that you can you can actually have a, a more um, a standard kind of environment, which is a, a system of harmonic oscillators. And um, there are cases at very small temperatures right here. The, the environment is supposed to model a leaky cavity. So, at, you know, very small temperatures. So the idea is that you have a very small occupation number close to vacuum. And the spectral profile of the environment is has a peak, right, at, at some frequency. And um, this kind of environment 
which is a kind of prototypical environment for open quantum systems. This, if you add the driving, which is this thing right here, uh, this can still be solved exactly, and this is precisely what, what we need. Um, okay, so again, I, I'm not really showing you details about how to solve this model or, or anything like that. That can be found in the paper. Um, I just want to show you how it, how this works in practice, right? So here we have the, re, the state of the system, the reduced density matrix for my two qubits, for my two two level systems. Um, you can write the evolution as a function of these two uh, sign dependent functions, C1 and C2, and derive equations of motion for the, those quantities. And that's really what you need, you know, to describe the evolution of the system, equation of motion, right? And these two functions are, here is the coupling to the environment, and here is, uh, sorry, and here is the, the, the field, the driving, right? And so the driving up to now, we don't know what that is, right? We're going to optimize over it. And the way that works is that um, once we chose, once we choose the couplings between the qubit and the environment, um, and we fix the evolution time, we are going to numerically search for the best choice of uh, fields in each case to optimize what's called the concurrence, right? So the concurrence is just a property of the state that measures the entanglement. Uh, and so I'm going to, in each case, right, we fix the couplings, we fix the evolution time, and then we uh, find the fields that optimize the degree of entanglement that is achieved by, by the evolution. Um, okay, so let me let me then show you some results, right? I'm not really showing you how how the procedure is done, right? Uh, it's just some standard numerical optimization. I just want to show you what what the result is. So let's start with this first protocol, the one that we call the single address, right? So here we expected non-Markovianity to play a major role, and what we're going to do is then, as I was saying before, I fix the evolution time. I choose the couplings randomly between the system and the environment, and we run this optimization, right? And once we run the optimization, we get some final entanglement optimized, and I'm going to plot that as a function of the corresponding degree of how non-Markovian the map was, right? How many information backflow there was in the evolution, which was related to those revivals that we, I was showing you before. If I compute this and it gives you a very small number uh, below some threshold, then I'm going to associate that with the evolution being Markovian, and I'm going to analyze that in the next plot. So if I do this procedure once, I get one point, right? I get, I choose the couplings, I have a system, I optimize the entanglement, and I calculate the degree of non-Markovianity. So that tells me, well, that evolution had this degree of non-Markovianity, and it gives me this entanglement. And if I do this, I repeat this many times, this is what I find, right? If I this, if I repeat that for a different evolution time, uh, this is also what I find. So what's the point here? The point here is that we observe, right, that in this protocol, the optimized concurrence, which is the maximum degree of, of entanglement that you can achieve, is basically found to be a monotonic function of how non-Markovian evolution is, right? So, for a given time, say the red points, different realizations, right, different couplings that give me the same amount of non-Markovianity roughly give me the same amount of entanglement. So, this uh, reveals that a higher information backflow allows for better control which is precisely what we had argued before. And we you know, obtain very similar results for, for the other model, the one in which we have uh, a very small environment. Okay, so this is nice. Um, however, what happens with, I said that we have all these other points that give me very small non-Margoianity. Well, those cases are now plotted here. So, the red, the black points here are the same as before, but now the x scale is logarithmic. So, you know, these black points are the same as before, and now we have all of this, these new guys that weren't plotted before. 
So these ones, we are associating them with Markovian evolution, right? Because this measure is so small that it's basically, you know, within the error of the simulation, the numerical simulation. And so you can see, uh, this is not unexpected, that even for Markovian evolution, you, the, the, the systems can get entangled, which is fine. But what's, what's the, the trick? Here we are uh, comparing the optimized uh, concurrence, which is black, with the non-optimized one, which is uh, the crosses, the yellow crosses. So the unoptimized is basically saying, well, you know what? I'm not going to control the system. I'm going to turn off this field, and I'm going to see how many entanglement the system developed on its own. And so this is, to me, an extremely interesting plot because it's telling you that if the system was Markovian, right, then the field does not play any role because the concurrence with and without the field is the same. So co consistent with our discussion, uh, you know, when the, the environment is such that there is no flow of information from one to two, then the field is not really helping at all. But when you start to get this uh, non Markovianity, we get the opposite, right? When you don't have the field, you get some entanglement, which can be optimized by the presence of the field, right? And it can be optimized a lot in some cases. And again, this uh, is, tell me, is telling us that the control can only do something useful when there is no Markovianity. And this is really the main reason. All right. So oh, um, for comparison, I saw I told you before that the, we had this other protocol, right? The global addressing, where we said that no macro entity should not play any role here or any major role. And so here I'm going to show you results of all that. And the idea is that so here I'm going here on the is the same kind of plot as before, and um, I'm going I'm showing the single addressing, so the previous protocol. And if I now plot the same results, but for this new scheme, we find that there is no kind of clear uh, relation between the non markovianity and the concurrence, right? So mo most specifically, you can have realizations, right, for, that have very different degree of non markovianity which lead to very different concurrences. Sorry, uh, that I said that wrong. We, we have realizations that have the same degree of non markovianity as, for example, this one and this one that lead to very different concurrences, okay? And again, this is kind of similar or consistent with the discussion that, that we were having before, saying that if we are controlling this way, then uh, we don't expect information backflow to play a major role. Now, there is some, I mean, th these are not random points on the plane. There is some dependence and, you know, we can talk about that if, if you want, but um, the main issue here is that there are kind of wild deviations between different uh, realizations that give the same uh, no All right, so um, that's really all I had. Um, so I just wanted to finish with, with a few comments. Um, <clears throat> so in the first part of my talk, I wanted to give you this overview of uh, controlling open quantum systems uh, and and I think that what's interesting about this and what's important is that, as I we were discussing at the beginning, to construct a quantum device, one needs to manipulate an isolated quantum system. And I just want to emphasize the contradiction in some sense in that. You know, it, if, if the system is isolated, how are you going to manipulate it? So there's always going to be a trade-off, right? You need to open the door a little bit to the system to be controlled. And that is going to bring noise and it's going to bring coupling to other things. And so it's very important to understand controlling open quantum systems and what is it's possible in principle. Um, you know, I painted this picture at the beginning where the coherence is typically an enemy, right? But um, the, the goal of the second part is to illustrate that non unitary evolution, right, these general maps, are very can be very rich and there are might be features of the environment that can be used for our advantage and that's uh was the the the, the goal of of telling you our work in which we identified 
a family of controls and areas where the success of the control uh, increases monotonically with the amount of information backflow from the environment back to the system, which is one way of characterizing the microorganity. And, um, you know, doing control in, in these kind of systems, uh, here I, I haven't really showed you any application, but it sh should be really interesting to think about uh, applications of this in the sense of using this information backflow that we now know that can play a role to some particular task, right? Um, I was thinking, for example, of near-term quantum sensing in which, you know, in quantum sensing you always have noise and uh, trying to think about scenarios in which this uh, evolution might be non-Markovian uh, could uh, help us uh, understand whether those might uh, be beneficial in turn uh, or we, co we compare in comparison to the Markovian case where uh, to get some advantage from sensing. Um, recently, there has been a lot of uh, studies on error mitigation for quantum simulation um, that assume a Markovian environment, so it might be interesting to understand whether this information backflow could relieve some of the requirements needed to error mitigation in those systems. And, 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 you know, I'm sure there are, there are many others. All right, so um, with this, I'd like to thank you uh, for your presence and your attention. I know it's very, it's kind of late uh, over there. And uh, so thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, just a clap uh, uh, virtually as well. Um, thank you. Uh, Apurva, you have a question. Yeah, there is a general evolution uh, scenario for discrete time evolution, that is cross decomposition or super yeah. operator uh, language, and that can handle both Markovian and non-Markovian uh, in the same uh, logic, but uh, you cannot make it into a continuous uh, evolution equation. So that can still be useful in the language that you take discrete time steps and I think this a uh, dynamical decoupling or uh, even floquet theory which condensed matter people use uh, can be put into this particular form where you can get some advantage out of it. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, so, I mean that's uh, something that, you know, I haven't studied that myself. So when, when I say that there is no unified mathematical framework. I basically mean that, you know, we of course we have Krause composition uh, to express any CPT map, and uh, for sure that's really the, the approach that one needs to use to write a motion on CPT map. Um, what you know, in the context of quantum control, what you typically want is an equation of motion, right? Uh, and and you know a master equation, and that's what perhaps tricky to obtain in the non-Markovian case, even from the Krause decomposition. But it's definitely true that in this discrete time setting, if one assumes some Krause, particular Krause decomposition that sh now should depend on time, one could one could try to to do this. Um, for example, try to uh, optimize to say. Uh, I don't know, try to optimize the entanglement or the concurrence in these kind of systems. Okay. Um, any other questions? So, uh... Is it uh, uh, hello. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, nice to see that. And, uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. Um, so application of controllability. Uh, the um, that was a good takeaway. You know, so there are uh, more of this. Maybe there is a, some, there is something called dynamic extension algorithm that maybe we tried for uh, so it's a little bit like you know geometric thing and uh, but it can be tried for the you know the non markovian uh, things to you know, generate this uh, this uh, what is known as cotton extensions mm 
Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, that can be uh, one one method and one approach to uh, deal with it. And uh, yeah, and uh, and what's interesting is like you know uh, like you know to actually get a you know like a stochastic formulation out of this you know like. Uh, like, uh, because the uh, uh, because this in a non uh, like uh, essentially the non smoothness is there and translate it into a, an approximate stochastic system for for a useful you know like controllability that would be another interesting aspect I think yeah yeah, yeah. I think that one of one of the main well not the main but one of the first uh, studies that at least I found where they use these optimal control tools for non Markovian system was precisely using that formalism, the one of stochastic master equations. Mm -hmm. um, that was I, maybe a bit before people started. Uh, well, I don't know it before, but it, it, I, I don't think it was related to this concept of information backflow at, at that point. So I think yeah. that what's interesting of the measures of non-Markovianity is that it allow, it gives us a way of really distinguishing, you know, the 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 general just divide, right? The, the ones that yeah. are coming from the ones that are normal to understand whether there is some property of the evolution being more general than Markovian that is important. Um, because, you know, sometimes it's just, well, you increase the coupling it, and it doesn't matter whether it's Markovian or non Markovian. Yeah. You know, you yeah. get a different kind of yeah. Yeah, true. So there is maybe a concept of there is some concept uh, called like a local flatness, like basically. Yeah, you know, like a construct a distribution, which is uh, like a like an Erisman, uh, you know, like a horizontal distribution or something like that, and and to see the flatness of the system, to see the you know the controllability, like you know, maybe you know that is like a like a hunch, like which uh, which is suffering to me. Uh, but but one needs to uh, probably you know uh, work it out in uh, this. Uh, these uh, distributions or these connections may not be, you know, uh, trivial maybe to construct. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I uh, can I ask a quick question from a purely experimental viewpoint. I'm an yes. experimentalist, so we try to make devices. Um, so I mean, there are several now quantum systems. I mean, starting from which are is I mean, it, which could be made isolated. I mean. Um, you have got diamond centers, you can have photons and whatever it is. So um, is Markovianity is a concern for any of these systems? I thought they mostly are, uh, I mean, I, I might be wrong here, but um, the noise that we encounter in these systems, uh, the experimental systems, do we have any sort of uh, example of Markovianity? So, uh, I mean, definitely, in many systems, right, the level, so especially in part in small systems, the level of noise and the level of, uh, say, coupling to external degrees of freedom is so small that, you know, we can do uh, very good operations without even concerning about them. Um, as we scale up, I would say that one, I mean, Particularly in, in in systems like uh, solid state systems, or perhaps I'm, I'm thinking in particular of superconducting qubits. As a scale up, I would, you, you know, environments have uh, a, a spectral densities which are not, uh, which have some features, and as you know, I think that there there might be an interplay between. The, the environment and the and mostly the fact that there are incomogeneities, right? And particularly for systems like superconducting qubits, where uh, when I say as we scale up, is that you know we're going to have many of them. They are not identical to each other, and these small variations from element to element are going to they basically induce like something like decoherence, right? And that decoherence can, you know, in principle. Uh, that added to the perhaps uh, a spectral density with some features. Uh, and if you have, when I say spectral density with some features, basically I'm saying that um, environments or noise that could lead to non-Markovianity, 
Uh, for these large systems, I would say that so these are effects that can definitely be seen. Uh, it you know it depends on how precise you want to be, I think. Uh, so if you have a large system and you have you want a very high fidelity, I would think that these effects are are um, important. Um, but yeah, I mean it remains to be seen whether you know one can reach above threshold, you know, one and two qubit gates with yeah, in, in systems that are so clean that you never need to worry about this. Um, for things like quantum simulation, for example, where one thinks about maybe the evolution of the whole system, which is big, I, I think that it, this is something to, to consider. Um, but it all depends really on the, the, on the level of detail and the level of precision that you want at the end. All right. Um, OK, is there any other question from anybody? I know it's getting late here. Um, OK, uh, I can't see any further question. Uh, so in which case, uh, I would like to thank you for the talk. And it was, it was rather interesting because I'm kind of, I was, I was getting, I was sort of relating it to the kind of experimental setup that we make. And uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully it was useful for the audience as well. Uh, we should thank you for agreeing to give the talk and hopefully we'll meet offline sometime. Yeah. Um, yeah. OK, thank you very yeah. much. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, stay in touch. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Bye bye.